Lynn, good morning. How you doing? Good morning, guys. How are you? Well, you know, it's it's just obviously disheartening to see the Bears uh, come up with a, a game plan where they actually score some points, where the quarterback does some great things, and where you're leading a game pretty handily, and then you just kind of, I don't know, death by a, a thousand uh, a little uh, knife cuts. It felt like they were just draining out as that went on, and obviously you come down to that field goal decision, whether to take the points, whether to run a play. And, and as we've talked about, it, it's not so much going for on fourth down, although it was weird the way they burned a timeout to get to that spot. But what are you doing operating out of the shotgun? If you're going to do that, don't you try to play some power football? Uh, the play now was looking at it again this morning. I had thought – uh, last night watching it, I thought that that last uh, play, not the last one, but the fourth and one play by Justin Fields and, and um, uh, Herbert gets stopped. Justin Fields does have a read on that play, and he's reading Cooper, the end, and he he does hold the backside. I didn't think it was a read because he didn't really fake it out. And I think it's Tunyon out there who's going to lead block for him, which does give the Bears offensive line really good numbers inside because he is holding – uh, the, the threat of Justin Fields keeping the ball out of shotgun, which is why you put him in shotgun. Uh, it, it, it holds the backside defenders and it gives the Bears a good number count inside. So they have alignment for every defender. And I think that Darnell Wright said in an interview after the game that he takes a bad angle there and Singleton shoots through his linebacker. He turns his shoulders, which you never want to do on a double team. I won't bore the listener with all the details in offensive line play, but his linebacker does shoot through and get a tackle there. And to be honest with you guys, uh, their offensive line on that play, not a lot of wins across the board, right? Not a lot of guys winning uh, their matchup or moving uh, the Denver Broncos defense off the ball. And through the game and through that half, you could see that the Bears offensive line was winning, was coming alive. And you thought that that, that would be a good play, even out of gun. I can see why. Uh, Getsy called that. I would like to see Justin Fields fake that a little harder like he has the ball, but I don't think Singleton would have held anyway. But uh, I, I know what you're saying, under center, hand it off. But the offensive line, they still would – I don't know if they would have made their blocks there the way the Denver defense won on that play. Earl, and help us understand this because the Bears a year ago against the Packers did a similar thing uh, a fourth and in inches at the goal line, fourth and goal in – they were stopped and they lined up in the shotgun yesterday. You explain it well, and I can understand the rationale behind wanting to do that. But I think that a lot of people struggle to understand, and I guess I would count myself in this category. You've got a physical court quarterback, and you have other teams that execute the quarterback sneak well. You need three feet to basically win the game. Why not just take the take the obvious path to try to do that with the quarterback sneak? Is that something that – you think would have been more acceptable had they failed. Yeah, I, I love it, David. And, and I also love, um, I, I put a clip on Twitter last night of when Harbaugh asked Lamar Jackson in, in a kind of a similar situation in his second year, do you want to go for it? And what play do you want to run? And, and I, want, I wonder if that's what Justin Fields wanted to run. I would love to know what they talked about on the sideline, right? Because at that moment, like guys, we've been talking so many weeks here about building culture for the Chicago Bears, right? About getting your building, moving in the right direction, a winning culture. And is this guy our franchise quarterback, right? And I'd like to know the conversation on the sideline between Eberflus, Getze, and Fields. I saw on the TV copy, and I can't see the whole sideline, obviously, from home. But I saw him, uh, Fields talking to Janoko and standing by the backup quarterback. So I don't know uh, what all the communication was. Was that the play Justin Fields wanted? But as you're saying, uh, uh, David, Here's a quarterback who's a big, strong athlete. Quarterback sneak or quarterback power and get him moving downhill. We got a hat for a hat if our running back is blocking. And I'm getting Justin Fields moving down downhill straight ahead if I'm going out of the gun. Uh, quarterback power, uh, as anybody who's ever played football for me uh, at St. Mary's Little League and still plays football uh, at Carmel, I will call power on third and 20. So I love uh, that <laughs> idea of just running that ball downhill and getting your big quarterback going. and also giving him a chance at that time to say, this is your team. What do you want to do here? And what play do you want to run? 
This segment with Olin Krutz is sponsored by Plumbers 911. Plumbing emergency, call the plumbing professionals available 24 7 at 1 833 Plum 911. And, and Olin, um, bizarre story with, um, with Chase Claypool. Just a weird story all the way around. Obviously, they did not punish him when he had the bad opening game. He apparently had apologized sufficiently, so they stayed with him. And then he complains that he's not being used correctly on a Friday. The coach made a point to saying that's not why he was inactive, but it's hard to imagine that that didn't play a role. And sure enough, um, he's not at the game. Coach said he had the option. They correct him, the PR staff. He was told to stay home. Rumors are the Bears looking for a fifth or a sixth for a guy that cost them the 32nd pick in the last draft. It, it just appears they're done with them. And it appears that um, that they'll take anything. And maybe, maybe even like a swap of picks or something. But it also appears like they're not going to get anything for the guy. Are you are you on board with just ending this thing because it's it's just tiresome, or do you think they they need to uh, con- reconsider what they're doing and and contemplate the value of of the player versus what they're going to get back? Yeah, mother, we talked about this in a pregame show, and they went and did it again. Right, that second press conference, the one I need with my wife. When I say things <laughs> or do something, I need to have I need to be able to come back out and say, well, uh, I didn't really mean that, and this is what Coach Ben, and then I got to get somebody. Like one of my kids to come on and say, well, dad really meant this. He didn't really mean what he said there. But uh, the whole Chase Claypool thing is, is interesting to me. It's, it's a lot of media and a lot of coverage for a guy who hasn't done a lot, right? He hasn't done a lot for the Chicago Bears. If he's causing you this much problem, uh, it's very simple to me. Your talent has to be worth your baggage. And right now, his talent and his production is not worth his baggage. So you move on. You move on and you're just answering way too many questions about Chase Claypool for the way he plays, right? If the guy is a number one wide receiver, if he's dominating out there, if he's putting up 100-yard receiving games, scoring touchdowns, and he is affecting the defense on every play, by that I mean he's helping your run game because you have to double-team him, and now when they double-team DJ Moore, you can't cover Chase Claypool. That's what they need out of that position. That's what they need out of that guy. He's not giving you that. He's only giving you uh, that you have to answer a question every day about him. I have to answer a question every day about him. So why don't the Bears do me a favor and we can all move on? I agree, Olin. Well put. Back to the game. I would hope you can explain this play, what happened from your perspective, because you would, you see things that others kind of miss. Justin Fields has a naked bootleg. It's the fourth quarter. You got a 28-21 to 21 lead. There's seven minutes left. You can't afford a turnover. And yet, Benito comes untouched, and it's a, it's a great defensive play. It, we know what happens next. It was uh, the scoop and score. At that point, what should Justin Fields have done, or was he rendered helpless so you understand what happened because it's hard to make a decision that quickly, and we can say, yeah, he should have protected the football. Is that fair to hold, expect him to protect the football under those circumstances? No, it's, it is really fair. It's fair that he has to take the sack there. Now, he turned around, and that defensive end, uh, outside linebacker in the Denver Broncos system, was in his face immediately, and the fake is supposed to take care of that guy, right? The fake of the play is supposed to get that guy going, and Justin Fields can break contain the other way and get outside the pocket. I thought Matt Ryan did a great job last night, guys, and you, and you really have to listen to guys who have played quarterback a long time in the NFL, who's gone through their own struggles, who had to grow as a quarterback, and he kept saying from the first quarter, guys, he kept saying, I don't know if I'd keep turning a struggling quarterback back to the defense. And that's why sometimes, uh, like the Lions did a lot with their staff, it doesn't mean it always works. But that's why sometimes you want to have a guy in the building who's actually played the position in the NFL, who's actually developed, helping a young quarterback like Justin Fields develop. Because while Matt Ryan was saying it, I wrote in my notes, will this end up being a problem? And Matt Ryan, if you remember, he said that in the first quarter. You don't want to keep turning a young, struggling quarterback's back to the line of scrimmage, right? You want to keep his eyes forward, uh, basically keep him out of the gun and don't keep keep, keep turning his back like they do in this, uh, you know, the Shanahan boot outside zone system. Now, that's not to take the blame off Justin Fields. He does have to immediately see that defense end, realize there's a problem. He's trying to throw it away. It's funny there, right? Because as a coach, you'll say, when he fumbles it, you'll say, take that sack. And then it would have been 
of maybe a 10 or 12 yard sack and you say, man, I wish you could have thrown it away. Right. So it's always kind of a two edged sword there, but it, it's a good point by you. Uh, there's a few things he did late in the game that, that you, you start to think about his details, right? The details of playing quarterback, the not, the not taking the intentional grounding, the not taking the sack. I talked about that, that fourth and one where you'd like to see him really boot out there hard like he has the ball and see if he can hold anybody else on that defense. So um, he does have to eat that ball there. Uh, he, I'm sure Getsy would want that play call back. I'm sure he wants to just not try to throw that ball. And it's just a really, really at that moment, you, you just felt like, gosh, man, uh, that's, that is the worst thing that could have happened to a young quarterback, uh, uh, to an offense, to a play caller, who, who at that time, it looked like they were doing everything right. Justin Fields is reading the field, going through his progressions, dealing that ball. The Bears are running the ball. Uh, they were in control. And all of a sudden, that play happens. It it feels as if that was a worse loss than going into Kansas City. No one gave them much of a chance in Kansas City. They didn't play particularly well. Then you come home and you talk about being close and you talk about details and you come out and you, you had like the best outing offensively you've had of the season. And by the way, that Denver defense has got awful. But what is the <laughs> what what happens now? How do you how do you overcome that? kind of a wretched loss and then head on the road on Thursday. It, it, it seems like you worry about, as we've talked before, this kind of snowball effect on everyone. Yeah. And, and even with the defense, right, with all the injuries with Strowman in there, with Terrell Smith, with Elijah Hicks, uh, you know, with the rookie Tyreek Stevenson with, against this wide receiver core, uh, the Bears were playing really, really good football. I thought the defensive line also finally showed up in, in games, finally moved the, the quarterback off his pocket, put some pressure. Uh, the, the only way you can move on if you're the coach is, again, you, you, I mean, it's going to be redundant, but it's, again, guys, like, look, we took these steps, but but look at the fourth quarter. So, so you show them, you know, uh, uh, some, some, some of the really good they did, and then you got to show them the bad and be like, this is why we keep preaching that every detail on every play matters, right? Like you go to Darnell Wright and say, Darnell Wright, this is why you don't turn your shoulders on a double team. And credit to Darnell Wright. His head was up. He's throwing his hands on pass pro. He is getting better. He went around, He went against some good outside linebackers. And like you said, the Denver Broncos defense, I mean, they got their own problem. I'd be surprised if Vance Joseph makes it through the year. You know, probably Joe Vitt or someone down there, their defense coach, which is their problem. I won't go into a Denver analyst of their team, but uh, their defense is bad. But the, the, the Bears' young players – did show improvement in this game, guys. They did take a step. Uh, Brisker w was physical. He was blitzing. He was coming off the edge. He was disruptive. He was the, the uh, safety that you've been waiting to see out there. Uh, DJ Moore, he, you know, that catch in end zone, uh, unbelievable catch. He looked good. Uh, Cole Komet looked good. He looked physical, uh, although, you know, on that interception, you can argue he's got to fight across the safety's face and on that third and five, I think it was 35 or third and nine. Uh, in the game, he's got to fight across City's face. He's got to be big and strong in there for his quarterback, get to the ball. But they did show improvement. That, that Mullet, it's the only choice you got, right? The only choice you got is we got to go play this game really quickly against the commanders. So let's just look at the details that if we do these little things, we win this game to try to convince these guys that that is how you win games in the NFL. Those little mistakes start to pile up, and you see that in the penalties all in 10 for 91 yards by the Bears. You see – they I, jumped off five it, times, and, and the Bears had more penalties and more yardage, right? Isn't that crazy? It is. Mm -hmm. and, and you have other things that, that come up throughout the course of a game, Olin. And I wonder where you stand on you – know, it's easy to say from, from the outside, well, you know what, this Bears team, they've lost 14 in a row. They don't know how to win. They need to know mm -hmm. how to win. They have a losing culture, and they are trying not to lose, so they don't know how to win. Do you buy that as a former player? Is there something to that mentality that, that creeps into the mindset of a team? I'm all in on that, David. I'm all in on that. There, there was a point in, in our career late there I, where we talk a lot about on this show about how much we lost early in our career. Ted, uh, Ted Washington and Larry Wigman, Wigman and guys like that. I know the listener nowadays is going to have to go Google those names that I just said <laughs> since I'm, <laughs> I'm older now. But they came in and showed us – showed us a winning culture showed us leadership, right? I remember, uh, I forget exactly what game it was, but we won a game and we came into the locker room and everybody was cheering. Uh, it was only like week three or four. It would have been like what the Chicago Bears just went through 
Uh, this is 2001 when we had that 13 and three season. And we're all cheering because, man, we hadn't won a lot around here. You just got to go back and look at our records uh, for the Chicago Bears when I got here, 98, 99, 2000. I'm talking about 2001, our first win. You would have thought we won the Super Bowl. And Ted Washington screamed at us. And he said, stop acting like you didn't expect to win. This is only week three or four. And, and learned a lot that day about winning in the NFL and building culture and, and just a lot from those guys. And, and, and as we went on, uh, David and Molly, I became – a worse football player, obviously, because I was getting older, but we knew how to win. We knew at what moments in games the details were most important. And you saw that yesterday for the Chicago Bears. And we knew, and that's more mental toughness. And mental toughness, all that is in football is doing the right things in critical pressure situations. And those are the things that these Chicago Bears, the young football team has to learn. And that's why I was talking about uh, recognizing culture moments if you're the head coach. If you're Coach Eberflus, recognize a culture moment. You probably should have that in your little book somewhere. A culture moment, make sure we recognize it. And that was that right there, fourth and one. And in a culture moment, you want to go see your, your guy, your quarterback. You want to talk to your leaders about what they want to do because what you're doing there, guys, is you're handing them the football team. And that's how you win in the NFL. Your players take over the football team. They take over right in the locker room. They take over demanding that their teammates give them details in critical situations. So, yes, I do buy into that. And, yes, it's something they have to learn. Yeah, I, you know, I think, that, like uh, you mentioned, there were some great moments earlier in the game. Um, I thought that Fields pass where he pulled up and threw to Komet, um on a run. That looked like Mahomes. It looked like something we had just seen the week before. And, um, and for whatever reason, they totally got away from him after uh, – after that uh, that fumble and the scoop and score, if you if you just break down the plays, they they weren't throwing the ball until the final drive, and they got the ball out of his hands, and they they got uh, the running back more involved. Um, mm -hmm. Is is that is that on them or is that reacting? I mean, is that coaching scared? Yeah, you're, you're confused, right? Because we've been talking about okay, we understand what you're doing by keeping him in the pocket. We understand that you're trying to see, can he do it, right? Now, all of a sudden, here it is. And he did fumble. But remember now, I think it was third and five, and Borum jumps, right? He gets his false start. Mm. And then it's third and 10. And Justin Fields sits in the pocket. He avoids the rush a little bit, and he's off for 20 yards, right? He's off, and it's a first down for the Chicago Bears. I'm talking about the same drive we had the fourth and one. It's a first down because Justin Fields reads, he goes, and he uses his feet. He doesn't see the ball again, guys. Now, again, I'd have to go through the plays go through the all 22 and really check on which one was zoned and which one were reads and which one could he have kept the ball in this, this triple option type spread offense run scheme, right? So I'd have to see that. But, um, I, you know, we were talking about you'd be keeping him in the pocket, keeping him in the pocket, keeping him in the pocket. Now all of a sudden he runs for 20 yards and for seven plays in a row, he doesn't see the ball again in his hands and he's not a part of it. And, and like you're saying, now they, they do get the ball back. But like you're saying, guys, uh, uh, just on that final drive, you're just very interested in, in, in the play calling leading up to that inside zone read that they don't get. Oh, and before we let you go, quickly, everyone around town is going to ask you or ask us or talk about the Bears. Well, geez, can they make a change? Oh, boy, is that a fireable offense? You hear it all the time. And I just wonder, from your perspective, how you answer those questions and, and what attention do you think – how closely this is bothering ownership at this stage. You're only four games into a head coaching tenure. The second season of a head coach's tenure and a little early to be talking about that, or is it? No, it's, it's never too early to be talking about has the head coach lost his team or lost the building. And we talked about a li little about this last week, but I think the team showed you that, uh, that they, they, that the coach hasn't lost them with the way they came out and played and executed, and it looked like they had energy. And honestly, because we talked about it so much, you were looking at them. I was looking at them on the sideline, and they were engaged with their coaching staff. Uh, they were talking, the looks in the eyes, where they're into this game. They wanted to win this game. Now, here we go again, David. That is a tough loss, man. Oh. That is a tough loss for a young team. Can you get them as a head coach to accept their responsibility on the side of the loss? Can you get them? Because that's the way – that you know that your players have bought in when you look at them and say, look, on this play, 
you have to do this. And as a coach, you're looking at them because if they roll their eyes, you've lost them, right? You've lost them buying into what you're trying to say to what you're trying to coach. So uh, Kevin Warren, again, Ryan Pose, uh, there is a picture on that fourth and one. Poor guy, man. I, I'm, I'm watching the TV copy. And Jeff King, yeah. uh, player personnel guy, he's sitting in front of Pose, and he's all of Chicago at the moment. They don't get that fourth down. I don't know what he says <laughs> into his hands, but I'm sure it's a few F words, right? Uh, and you don't blame him. There's a lot of frustration up there at Hallisaw. And these men up there working to win, they put in hours of work, right? And, and it doesn't look like it when it comes down to that loss. But uh, you're always – you always got you always got to have the pulse of your team, no matter who you are in that building. If you are in a leadership role, and if Coach Flues or anybody uh, on that coach staff completely loses their guys, like Sean Payton is probably looking at Vance Joseph this morning on film, taking the temperature of his team. Eventually, you do have to make a change. The problem with the Chicago Bears is they have built this staff to where when you look at it, you say to yourself, "That's fine," but now who, right? Who yeah. steps up into the head coach role? Who is the defensive coordinator? Right. Who, you know, if I get rid of, say, Getsy, can Genova call plays? They don't have an incredibly, you would say, a veteran or strong uh, coaching staff up there at Hallis Hall right now, especially with the loss of Allen Williams. Great stuff, Olin. Thank you. Thanks, Olin. Thank you, guys.